Hello, my dear friends, how are you? Welcome, thank you for joining me here. I'm Marty Thurger, and today I'll be talking about the goddess Sigyn. I've already talked about this goddess in the past, a little over seven years ago, <laughs> at the beginning of creating content for YouTube. Uh, it was actually the very first request uh, I got from the community in this channel by Kiki Vanessa Nunes, I still remember. Um, the, the video still has Mr. Thorstein in the introduction. Some people loved him, some were not so sure how to take him, and some people were no fun at all. Which I don't know why. I think Mr. Thorstein was actually pretty cool. <clears throat> hey, I still am! <laughs> Jesus, fuck! <laughs> That's exactly what people say when they see me naked. <laughs> Mr. Thorstein, it, it, it has been so long, ages. Where have you been up to? Where have you been? Well, I've always been here, enjoying doing absolutely nothing, <laughs> just haunting the place. Oh yes, I see. Interacting with my own hallucinations and forcing you to watch. <laughs> That's exactly it. It is what it is. Right, uh, back to today's subject. Uh, there wasn't a lot of information about this goddess back when I did that older video and there isn't much now after almost eight years. But there's, there's a thing or two we can say about her, for sure. <laughs> um, some interesting points that might give some light into her role as a goddess. As you know, Sigyn appears as Loki's wife in the poem Voluspo, uh, as well as being the mother of Nari. Uh, she's also present in the poem Lokasena. Uh, she appears much later in the Gilfaginning and Skaldskaparmal in the Prose Edda by Snorri Sturluson, where she continues to be presented as Loki's wife and the mother of Nari or Narfi. In Gilfaginning, we are presented with different details concerning Loki's punishment and concerning Sigyn, there, there aren't a lot more details concerning her role, right? Uh, she also appears in a much earlier poem in Hoslong by the skald Tjol, uh, Tjolof of Finn, uh, which is a sign that Sigyn isn't a mere invention of later mythology and she might have indeed been a goddess with specific roles in pre-Christian times. As I said here many times before, concerning some deities of Old Norse mythology, uh, some names of gods and goddesses were later additions to the mythological content composed in post-Christian periods, particularly in Icelandic medieval literature, and some other deities' names were pure poetic embellishments, not actually being divinities that were once worshipped, but exclusive content for poetic purposes. And then, of course, uh, there are uh, some gods, uh, some names of gods, uh, certain gods that were indeed understood as deities, but no, no actual role was attributed to them. And indeed, sometimes we get to see in some world mythologies, particular gods that have no function at all, but were considered divinities or divine entities nonetheless. So, in terms of Norse mythology, certain names of gods and goddesses are just literary compositions, and we are not faced with uh, entities that were actual gods, uh, gods understood as divinities, and this is more recurrent in goddesses' names, right? Which were neither worshipped nor were they known as actual or actually being divinities, but solely poetic inventions for the sake of the beauty of a poetic work. However, this doesn't seem to be the case of Sigyn. Despite no clear role, she seems to have been considered an actual goddess. If people in the past worshipped her or not, maybe they did, we don't know. There aren't a lot of evidences on the worshipping of all Norse gods, aside from some clear instances concerning Odin, Thor and Freyr, and sometimes a few glimpses here and there of a possible presentation of cult and religious conduct towards some others. This doesn't mean that the recognition of a deity was solely transported to a religious and or cultic performance, because as we have the case of the god Tyr, uh, despite the, few, uh, the, 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 the very few evidences, 
the mythological appearance of this deity was important enough to create objects that transported the mythological content into actual physical objects, or at least alluded to specific mythological content, which shows a clear interest in this deity, at least in some of uh, its mythic contents. Um, in the case of Sigyn, however, it is hard to understand her role other than the one that survived until our days, which seems to have been solely to hold a basin over her husband's head to catch the venom dripping from a snake or a serpent under which her husband, Loki, is bound as a punishment which, in Lokasena, is the, is the punishment for insulting the gods and in Gilfagining is the punishment for the death of Baldr. There are a couple of uh, translations of the name Sigyn, either Victory Girlfriend or Woman Friend of Victory, or in uh, the one that I agree with the most, Victory Woman, which seems much more appropriate and more direct, giving us our association with victory, which by itself is a whole sentiment with many layers and ha has nothing to do with a warlike context, but more under the emotional sense of victory, which seems like a cruel epithet as her role and the, the story in which she is inserted is quite the opposite of victory, as, as we shall see further ahead. So Sigyn's role is completely overshadowed by Loki, as even in an earlier period she was already known as Loki's wife, and uh, not much is told about her. And, uh, and this role is carried on until no more Old Norse myths are created. It is particularly curious her appearance in the Voluspo. Loki is punished by his deeds and is sent off into the earth, beneath the earth. There are, there, there are several translations for this particular passage, either a grove of valleys uh, or a, a grove of hot springs, or much more poetic, beneath the grove of cauldrons. I particularly prefer the last two and seem to be far closer to the actual theme. <laughs> now, theme, uh, am I saying it right this time? <laughs> is, is this the correct pronunciation? Good gods, some of you, I tell you. But, but I mean, thank you for helping me out with the English pronunciation, uh, but, but I think you could have a, a less trollish approach. Just saying. Uh, and I'm watching you, Law. We will talk later. <laughs> anyway, um, these last two translations are particularly interesting for two main reasons. Loke is indeed associated with fire. I have given this explanation in another video concerning Loke, both as the trickster spirit and as the spirit of air, attested in myths and folklore. Loke is associated with fire, with hot air, with heat. He is sent down into the earth, into hot springs. So this may be an allusion to the early Icelandic animistic perception towards landscape. Mind you that I'm not saying animistic in the very outdated understanding of early psychology, but very much as an important perception under a belief system that forces human communities to perform certain rituals when interacting with the land. Particularly this very good example of the first Icelandic settlers, which uh, take part on different rituals to create land connectedness and form a sense of belonging by introducing themselves to the land and its persons, to, to its other than human inhabitants. So, Loke here uh, continues to be associated with hot air, heat, fire, the force that will heat the water thus performing or forming hot springs, uh, giving a particular identity to hot springs and possibly here Loki becoming an important spirit of the land, a spirit entity of hot springs themselves. And further down the myth, there's the serpent that drips venom from above Loki that Sigyn collects into a bowl. However, she must empty the bowl when it is full and the venom that drips in the meantime on top of Loki causes Loki to shake and twist in pain, in agony, thereby causing earthquakes. So here we continue to have this association of Loki with volcanic activity in Iceland. And here we are, inevitably speaking of Loki. However, uh, 
there's the, the uh, another important aspect concerning hot springs, which is, well, look, it may indeed have been associated with hot springs as the spirit of hot air and heat that forces the earth to spill out hot water and to shake as well. But the place of his punishment is the earth and who is there to take care of him under the earth? Sigim. So Loki's introduction to the earth makes the earth express this phenomenon. So, without Loki, the fiery trickster spirit, the earth remains calm. So Sigin is the earth, she is the, the earthly realm, an underworld goddess. Taking into consideration pre-Christian continental European beliefs, especially in Western Europe or Western European belief systems, dividing Europe in half, so the, the Western half, and also in Pan-Celtic and in the Germanic cultural worlds, groves, and springs were usually considered places of the sacred divine, where particular religious beliefs were held. However, places of water, particularly springs, streams and rivers, were often associated with feminine entities of all sorts. So this particular aspect of Loki going down the earth, he is bound as a punishment in the womb of the earth, the realm of Sigin, an underworld goddess, which by her actions towards Loki, taking care of him, being loyal to her husband, her presentation of devotion towards the one she loves, indeed shows the personified nurturing aspect of the earth. In pagan beliefs, underworld goddesses and gods play several different roles and different from one another, surely, of course, uh, presenting the, the several animistic perceptions towards the earth itself, towards the, the landscape, which is the stage where absolutely everything plays out in an animistic view. Sigin personifies the nurturing aspect of the earth, which, with Loki's presence as the trickster spirit of heat and hot air, causes the earth to, causes Sigin's realm to display phenomenon such as earthquakes and hot springs. Loki's punishment is the expression of Earth's poetic beauty. However, this doesn't take away the fact that Sigin might have indeed been an underworld goddess, which goes in line with several Western European belief systems towards the feminine associated with underground waters, particularly in the form of goddesses that are then, with Christianization, associated with the Virgin Mary as the, the continuation of the caring Mother Earth. Uh, but I think that is pushing a little bit too far, but not entirely away from character, as we shall see further ahead. <laughs> um, now, the first point here is this possible piece of information that may give away Sigin's role as an underworld goddess. And Sigin is unhappy in the poems, unhappy for her cruel fate to hold the bowl while the snake drops venom so that her husband doesn't suffer and she has the role to take away the bowl, to empty it and then to hold it again to catch the venom in this perpetual cycle. Perhaps hot springs and earthquakes are also the expression of, of this underworld goddess's unhappiness, right? Uh, still, she carries out this performance, right, over and over again, cyclical performance. A fate she did not choose, but uh, as the caring mother and devoted wife, she is the personification of absolute loyalty, and so she carries on performing this. Such, as, su such a, a devoted, caring and loyal character, yet her fate is a cruel one. She deserves better, I would say. And perhaps this shows the cruelty of life and of one's decisions, particularly the decisions one takes, Loki in this case, that may affect others, the innocent ones, Sigin in this case. It shows that even one's own goodness isn't an escape from cruelty, unhappiness, sorrow and pain, because we are affected by others' actions, which in a way continues to demonstrate an animistic understanding on how one's own actions affect the whole, particularly affecting the earth itself, affecting Sigin. Uh, by the way, uh, it, it is quite curious, the, the, the snake playing a role here 
as the snake or the serpent symbology is not only associated with the underworld, but quite often associated with feminine entities, particularly those powerful in magic. And in the Norse myths, it is no exception that the snake or the serpent, the, the great serpent Jormungandr, as was explained here many times before in other videos, it is the personification of the earth itself, the, the spirit of the earth, the, the mighty Gandr. That is, the mighty magic and or the mighty spirit, earth's very force, the, the personification of the feminine as magic, which is, under the Norse myth's understanding, one of the primal forces of creation. The serpent symbology here further indicates Sigyn as a goddess of the underworld and a feminine entity related to primal, uh, the, the primal forces, of, or at least one primal force of creation. Sigyn could be then seen as yet another expression of the earth itself, but under its more caring aspect. Perhaps not nurturing, but caring. The earth's devotion to its creations. So, Loki's punishment is actually attenuated by the presence of Sigyn. In other words, because of the environment where Loki's punishment takes place, down in the earth, such suffering is attenuated due to the earth's caring aspects, but also at play the devotion and unconditional loyalty of one's love. Although admittedly, this last point I may be romanticizing a little bit, uh, as we may be in the presence of a more patriarchal meaning to this poem, uh, to, um, under the intention of presenting the image of how a perfect wife should be towards her husband. But still, if we take into consideration the more animistic aspects of it, we may indeed be in the presence of the Earth's devotional aspects, right? And since Sigyn was indeed considered a goddess, the, 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 these may have been some important roles associated to her character, this devotional, caring and loyal aspects that played some religious role, probably most likely within the domestic environment. Well, I mean, let, let's not forget the role of Loki as the hearth spirit, the spirit of hot air and heat and of the hearth, uh, and tending the hearth, tending the fire, and this caring and devotional action within the domestic environment towards taking care of the home. But perhaps, again, that's pushing it a little bit too far and prone to see patterns where there are none. Anyway, Sigyn, the victory woman protecting Loki from the venomous poison of his own punishment and suffering, which ultimately brings her suffering and, and, and being punished by something not of her own doing. I think we can see the bowl of poison as a poetic interpretation of the suffering we do, and when, 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 it, when it falls into Loki's face, he is reminded of the agony it causes, the agony of our mistakes, which, which from time to time we, we punish ourselves by such memories of what we have done. And Sigyn, on the other hand, dragged into this, representing the loyalty of love, as well as the collateral damage, the, the suffering of the innocence as the consequence of our mistakes. As if it wasn't enough, their son, Nari, is killed and his guts are used to bound Loki. So the, the cruelty of the gods' punishment has no limits. But well, Sigyn seems to have indeed been understood as a goddess, an actual goddess, whose role was progressively lost, as much of the mythological account uh, or the mythological accounts will focus much more on the most worshipped deities and the characters that played major roles both in the religious panorama as well as in the animistic cosmologies of Nordic Europe. But indeed, uh, there's, the, there's the interesting account in Locasena, which sees Sigyn as a goddess, indeed as an actual goddess. She is among the figures that are considered divine, when Aegir, the, the god of the oceans and the waves, the deity associated with the primordial place of origins of life, is invited by the Aesir to take part in their banquet, and then 12 Aesir, uh, Aesir in the sense of gods in the masculine, right? Uh, they are 
uh, presented and, 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 and take their places on the thrones and their names are, as you, as you can see on the screen. And then similarly, the Ausinur, the goddesses, uh, which are also presented and eight in number being Frigg, Freya, Eifion, Idun, Gerl, Sigin, Fula, Nana. This further indicates Sigin's condition as a goddess and not a mere poetic construction or a later mythological invention. A final point that I think it's worth mentioning, and I'm sure it cocked your attention as well, is the whole picture of Loke in the underground, bound and suffering, provoking earthquakes and associated with heat and possibly fire from the ground. That's right, this whole picture is suggestive of the Christian devil. In this context, uh, it is unlikely that the Christian devil influenced this myth but this time, more or less the other way around. This whole theme, theme <laughs> not influencing the Christian devil, but being one of the key points of Norse myths that helped Christians explain their own myths and thus convey a better religious message that appealed to the animistic views of the pagans, giving motifs that not only could help to introduce certain key aspects of Christian religion and myths, such as the whole theme <laughs> of the end of the world and the importance of saving one's soul, but also to facilitate, the, to facilitate in the process of conversion. This can be, be better witnessed in the famous monument, the Gosforth Cross in Cumberland, England. I've actually spoken about this monument before. Actually, um, sorry. <clears throat> Uh, there's, this, uh, there, there's, a, there's a fragment of a cross dated to the late 10th century located in St. Stephen's Church, Kirkby, Stephen, Cumbria in England, which features a bound figure with horns and a beard, often theorized to be Loki chained. I've spoken about this before on the video I've done concerning the question if Loki is a Christian invention or not, and how far do the Christian influences go on the figure of Loki, uh, those uh, who have watched the video already know the answer, so I'm not going to spoil it for the others. So please uh, watch that video if you have time, of course. I mean, I need views and comments to keep this show running. <laughs> it's true. But anyway, um, there are strong evidences that it could be the depiction of Loke in Anglo-Saxon context using Old Norse myths and imagery to convey a Christian narrative and by this evidence and of the next context I shall talk about in a moment, uh, we progressively see the Christian influences into the Old Norse myths, uh, particularly in the myth of Ragnarok, uh, that much later will be picked by Snorri Sturluson in the 13th century, precisely making a syncretism of beliefs to express the um, apocalyptic message through the myth of Ragnarok. So, uh, speaking of Ragnarok, uh, we must take into consideration a series of carvings on stone which were executed about the 10th, 11th century in northern England, uh, the Gosforth Cross, as I said, which uh, there's no doubt at this point such depicted scenes have been based on an account of Ragnarok closer, closely resembling that given in the Voluspo, and much later by Snorri as well. I've spoken about this monument as well in the video about Fidar, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> so, um, several specific scenes of this myth that have helped to express Christian religious conceptions and beliefs uh, by equating with some scenes of the myth of Ragnarok. Uh, but for the case of this video, of course, Sigin, uh, we have, uh, of course, obviously, uh, a particular imagery of a woman holding a bowl beside uh, a bound figure suggesting Sigin and Loke. Uh, it is clear that the artist worked on a series of scenes deliberately grouped together and all these scenes are capable of a Christian as well as a pagan interpretation. There is even a crucifixion scene on the other side of the cross and we are faced with a Christian monument with Old Norse imagery and myths. The monument was erected more or less at the same period when the earliest Icelandic written sources about Ragnarok were also composed, 
So there's no telling how much Christian influences were already in the Ragnarok myth 200 years before Snorri would add even more Christian religious conceptions to the same myth. Uh, be that as it may, uh, one of the scenes depicted uh, is seen in her act of devotion towards Loki. By this period, Loki must have been indeed a figure used to convey or also convey certain Christian understandings concerning the devil or a devilish-like figure. But picking on the figure of Sigyn is quite interesting. This devotional figure could just as well be used to convey the conception of the caring mother, the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, as it was a, a religious pattern among many Christian missionaries and clerical workers when faced with similar feminine entities of many cultures, at least all over Western Europe, the, the Western half of Europe. So, it would not have been strange the figure of Sigyn having been used in a Christian context to convey the message of the devoted mother and wife. Uh, that may be one of the reasons that led to the forgetfulness of Sigyn's role as a pagan goddess uh, by the greater emphasis on her devotion and loyalty to Loki, uh, which must have been a lot more underlined to the point of erasing everything else about this goddess and to our days, that's exactly what has survived, the act of devotion and loyalty and I, I would also say no small amount of sacrifice, also turning Sigyn into the grieving mother who lost her son, which was also sacrificed, just as the mother of Christ lost her own son as his act of sacrifice. Sadly, it is really hard to tell where the pagan conceptions end and the Christian ones begin. I mean, there is no ending and there is no beginning whatsoever. This is a wonderful, well-elaborated syncretism. But no doubt, I think it is safe to say that, in an animistic pagan view, Sigyn could be taken as the caring and devotional aspect of the feminine spirits of the underworld. My dear friends, I do hope you have enjoyed this video and may it be useful somehow. <laughs> At least may it shed a light on Sigyn and hopefully open other perspectives on this goddess which is seldom talk about, unfortunately, and th there's much more to her than just being Loki's wife. My dear friends, thank you so much for watching, see you on the next video, and as always, bye for now. Thanks for today, obrigado por hoje. Until we meet again, my dear friends.